All right, so welcome to the first lecture in the Debate Bridge Program. The Debate Bridge Program is really um, envisioned as a way to help debaters who currently debate in the AUDL um, transition and participate in the larger forensic community and take part in debates and other forensic activities, but primarily debate um, that happen in other um, spaces. And so those can be other uh, Urban Debate League tournaments are also other organizations like the GFCA uh, hosted tournaments. Um, and so really there are two components. One is the educational component, which all um, participants in the AUDL, um, parents, coaches, students are welcome to attend to learn more about um, debate and what it means to competitively debate in other uh, debate communities. Um, and then also the competitive component, which is limited to uh, high school students and their partners. Um, and you join that program as a partner. If you have more concerns about joining the program or if you're interested in joining the program, I would encourage you to check out the AUDL website. We've got more information there um, as to how it is that you can get more involved with Debate Bridge. Uh, students who participate in the program benefiting, benefit not only from lectures like this, from our awesome uh, speakers, but also from tutoring, mentoring, and support from former AUDL debaters, as well as uh, debaters and coaches from other uh, communities across the country. Um, this evening, we have a uh, lecture on the structural differences that you'd see between debate as it happens in the AUDL and in the other communities. Um, and this evening, the lecture is be given, being given by Alicia Tillman, who is a former AUDL to AUL debater, as well as a former debate ambassador, and Jordan Freeman, who is a current AUL debater and debate ambassador. So I'm going to turn it over to both of them. All right, thank you. Super excited. Uh, thanks to those of y'all who have come, uh, and hello to anyone who's watching this on YouTube. So let me share my screen. I'm old, I haven't done this in a hot minute. Present, there we go. All right, so the first major difference that y'all will see between uh, AUEL debate that you've been used to uh, in the, whether you're coming from middle school or a current high school debater is that the times will be a lot longer. So those of you who debated at the higher levels may be used to having uh, six minute constructives, four minute rebuttals, and two minutes for cross-examination. Uh, in the Georgia Forensic Coaches Association, one thing is that the times will be much longer. So you won't expect to see those six, four, two times except at the lower levels of GFCA debate. And at the varsity level, the standard is this eight, five, three. Uh, in the AUDL, we've pushed a lot of materials to try to help debaters get a good sense of kind of foundational debate skills uh, and topic education, but there is a very uh, structured standardized way that is a bit different that you can expect people to discuss and strategize about when they talk about rounds in the GFCA. So one good way to think about this is to, sorry, I had to admit someone. Uh, is to think of the round as divided into three different parts. You have the beginning part, which is your first three constructives, the neg block, which is when the negative has two speeches back to back, and then the rebuttals that end the debate. So to just give a quick run through, uh, the 1AC is and the 1NC are both the speeches where uh, the teams kind of just lay out what their and arguments for the round are going to be. So for the affirmative, this means uh, those advantages. So inherency plan, solvency, harms, all of that stuff. And then for the one NC, this can be a variety of things, which you know we'll talk a bit more about in future lectures. But the negative, in addition to having what you all might be familiar with is kind of like maybe one disadvantage and then making arguments against the one AC's arguments, uh, the negative can actually choose from a variety of things such as counter plans, critiques, topicality. Don't worry, we'll tell you what all that is later on in the semester. But uh, anything that the 1NC thinks that they might want to, that the negative thinks they might want to use later on in the round, they introduce in the 1NC. So the 2AC exists kind of to lay out um, initial arguments against whatever positions the negative introduced. So if they had disadvantages, this is where the 2AC introduces uh, some arguments against those disadvantages. And then it's also the place where they uh, pretty much respond to whatever 
uh, attacks against the one AC that the negative had. So these are very standard kind of things like you all are used to. Uh, what might be a little different to you all is that structurally, this isn't different, but the negative has their second constructive and their first rebuttal back to back. So I know that you've all seen this in rounds, but there are uh, a lot of implications strategy wise for what this means. So one way to think of the negative block that you hear a lot of people talk about is to think of it as just one really long speech. Uh, you usually won't see people use any prep time between the 2NC and the 1NR. Uh, you're more likely to see them just take a lot of prep before the 2NC and just go straight into the 1NR as soon as 2NC cross X is over. And additionally, people, you know, how you've seen the flowing templates probably that the AUDL has given out. Uh, that usually have one column per speech. The 2NC and the 1NR are usually flowed together as just one big speech again. So this is kind of where the negative gets to go in on pretty much their, those negative positions that they introduced in the 1NC. This is where they get to go into a lot of detail on them and pretty much try to overwhelm the app by having much more freedom to make more arguments and more in-depth arguments. So the rebuttals, uh, are pretty much, you know, that kind of wrap up portion of the debate where you have to make a lot of decisions about what you want to spend time on. So the 1AR is pretty much the most time crunch speech. It's pretty much trying to keep the affirmative alive after the negative has been able to create a barrage of arguments in the neg block. So strategically picking parts of what maybe the negative didn't do perfectly in order to kind of poke holes in it that leaves some sort of path to winning for the 2AR. Uh, the 2NR is the NEG's last speech. Uh, the 1NR doesn't really serve the usual purpose of a rebuttal because of its position in the NEG block. So the 2NR is the NEG's chance to pretty much pick their one best thing that they think they're winning the most on, uh, whether that be maybe a disadvantage that they had, topicality, a critique, uh, whatever, and go with that one argument, explain why they should win the round because of it, and then uh, pretty much clean up any loose ends in the arguments like, oh, are there any little arguments that the 1AR made against this thing that I'm going for that I should address? Are there any uh, arguments I want to definitely make sure the 2AR has to answer about their case? Uh, and then the 2AR is functionally doing the same thing uh, where they're wrapping the debate up for the AF and they have to t explain why doing their plan in the context of their advantages or single advantage, we'll talk a little bit about whether it'll be one or more in a bit, uh, why their plan and advantage is more important than whatever position the NAG made a big deal about in the 2NR. And to similarly, like, you know, clean up any loose ends, make sure there's no straight arguments that could take out the 2AR. All right, so kicking arguments is something associated with this idea that uh, there can be a lot of different arguments at the beginning of the round, and by the end of it, you just have pretty much like one big thing that you're focusing on whichever side you're on so while the affirmative can kick this is primarily a tool for the negative so as we said in the 1nc pretty much whatever you have the time to read you can read so if you want to have four disadvantages you can do that uh but you don't know when you don't necessarily know when you go into the round which of those four disadvantages in this example you're going to do the best on maybe the app has really good answers for two of them maybe they just have no idea how to answer one of them uh maybe they do a pretty good job spreading themselves out across the disadvantages but uh how strong a disadvantage will be isn't just a matter of how much you like it but how well the affirmative has done at answering it in the 2ac and the 1ar so the 2nr instead of just trying to kind of do a shotgun strategy of, oh, we have a lot of arguments, uh, maybe we'll win one of them, uh, wants to look at the round critically and think, which of these are we winning on? Which one is the strongest argument that we have right now against the aft? And pick that one and really go in on it. So kicking is pretty much saying, okay, those other disadvantages I was talking about, we're not, we're not worried about those anymore. We're not talking about them. And here's why. Uh, it doesn't matter that we're getting rid of them. So normally you might just think, okay, I can say I don't care about this argument, right? Uh, so let's just stop thinking about it. But there is a very important concept in debate that uh, depending on you know the rounds you've had, you may or may not be familiar with called turns. And a turn is pretty much a way in debate of taking an argument from the other side and explaining how uh, it actually hurts them 
slash helps you. So it's like another offensive argument that you could theoretically win around on like a disadvantage. But instead of being something you introduced, it's based on uh, an argument that the other side introduced. So disadvantages can be turned. There's two big types of turns, link turns and impact turns. So we'll dive in a little bit more to the specific parts of a disad later. But uh, the big idea with turns is that if you just say we're not, um, we're, we just don't care about these disads anymore, don't think about them, the affirmative still has the ability to make a link turn or an impact turn. So if you just focus on your one winning strategy in the 2NR, but you don't mention the other things, then the AF has free reign to say, actually, remember, we turned this, so this is another, so the disadvantage is another reason to vote for us, and the fact that they didn't mention it means that, you know, they agree with us and that this disadvantage is just another reason to, you know, vote for us. So we'll get a little bit more into that as we talk about disadvantages, but kicking arguments is pretty much just the idea that, okay, you can't turn this, but, and we're not going to talk about it anymore. So getting into disadvantages. This is something that I know y'all have seen and had uh, every year in your evidence packets through debate, but uh, it's really important to know every single distinct part of disadvantage structure because that's how, when earlier I talked about how the 1AR has to make a lot of decisions because they've gone through this horrible 13 minutes of the negative just making as many arguments as they want, the way that the app decides which arguments are the best ones to make to be the most efficient, save us time, and still leave us, you know, a way to win the debate is to pick apart the individual parts on this slide. So let's go into them a little bit. Uh, uniqueness is the idea that uh, the way the world is now is okay, but it's on the brink. So things are not great because if things were great, then it doesn't matter what we do because then we're just in a slightly less great world. Things are okay, but not great. If we make any big changes, if we rock the boat, we could easily slide into some uh, troubling waters. The link is an explanation of how doing the plan, implementing the plan, causes some change to the status quo. Uh, and then the internal link, which is not always specified as a separate part from the link, sometimes you'll just see it as part of the link, pretty much explains how whatever change the plan made changes that unstable status quo and causes us to go from okay to disaster mode. And whatever that disaster is, is the impact. So the reason that we care about all of these parts is because uh, point by point, without uniqueness, we pretty much just don't have any reason why doing the plan is bad. We can say, yes, the plan changes things, but if we were already in a bad state, then you know we don't really care. If the economy was in shambles, then the plan spending more money doesn't really change anything. Because if the economy being in shambles was going to cause some horrible disaster, it would have already happened regardless of the plan. Uh, similarly, with the link, we have to prove that the plan actually does something to our pre precarious status quo. If things are uh, unsteady but okay, and the, chain, and the plan doesn't actually make things any worse, then we can just continue being unsteady, but okay. Uh, and then similarly with internal link, we kind of just have to make sure we have some logical uh, link of chains, pretty much. Think of it as like, yeah, each part, each internal link argument is like a link in a chain connecting uniqueness to the impact. Uh, if we don't have that, then it's kind of just like, okay, the plan doesn't actually cause the impact, we don't care. And then of course, if you don't have an impact, then there is no horrible disaster scenario if you don't, excuse me, if you don't uh, reject the plan. So we can say, yep, we did the plan, we spent money, the economy's worse, who cares? Nothing that bad happened from that. Because sometimes internal links and links will be framed in a way that makes it seem like, oh, this is the bad thing. But really the important thing isn't just, uh, oh, the economy went down or, oh, we were a little weaker in this way, our military readiness went down or something like that, but it's kind of what the larger implications for that are. So these are the individual parts that you need all four of these to have a disadvantage and you need to make sure that you don't leave a way for the AF to come in and say, hey, actually, this is the change the plan causes and it's good, or actually this impact scenario you talked about isn't that bad, it's great. 
So, you know, those aren't the kind of things that you should expect to see like every single round, but you do want to be aware of how the affirmative could look at kind of the scenario you construct and say, actually, it won't play out like this. It'll play out in a really good way, which is essentially what a turn would be. So the neg blocks job is to just hammer in and go in onto detail on uh, the disadvantages and whatever other positions you have are. So the neg block does this in two parts. One, it, the first part of whichever speech is taking care of the disadvantage is the overview. This is a part where you kind of really quickly summarize what the argument of the disadvantage is, and then you also want to make sure that you explain why it's the most important thing in the round. Why is it more important relative to whatever horrible thing the app is talking about uh, is? And you all might be familiar with this in terms of Mr. T. If you've come to any debate camps or virtual site visits uh, over the past few years, you've probably heard of Mr. T, magnitude risk time frame. This is the part where you throw that in. And as a reminder about Mr. T, you don't have to say we have the biggest magnitude, the biggest risk, and the quickest time frame. You just need to pick the one that's the most reasonable that you could win. Like maybe it's the mo it's the worst possible scenario, but it's not super likely, or it's really likely, even if it's not the biggest disaster ever, and explain why that makes it more important than the AFS plan. And then uh, sometimes people will explain how maybe the implications of how the plan is implemented that cause the disadvantage uh, also somehow mean that the plan doesn't work the way it does. Maybe the plan actually makes their problems worse uh, and things backfire, which would be an example of turning the AF. And if you are going to use the logic of the disadvantage to turn the AF, which is something that, you know, we'd probably get into with more topic specific things than this generic scenario, that's something that you would do during this overview. So an overview is pretty much saying, hey judge, here's the deal, here's why you should care about it. And if you have a reason why it sinks the 1AC uh, and turns their logic on its head, then you can go in and add that there too. And then the second part of the speech you wanna focus on in a neg block is the line by line. This is pretty much where whatever arguments the 2AC made against the disadvantage, you wanna answer those in order because the judge will just be looking at their flow and say, okay, here are all the arguments the 2AC made against the disadvantage. And you just wanna, in order to be like, they said this, but, and then, next argument, they're like, okay, they said this, but, and pretty much explain why everything that the 2AC tried to do to knock out your uniqueness, links, or impacts were wrong. All right, so uh, the last little part that I'm going to cover for this lecture is just different types of disadvantages that you're likely to see in the GFCA. So topic disadvantages are ones that are usually applicable to any plan in a given year, given that it's actually an example of whatever the resolution is. So uh, you all probably know by now that the topic is criminal justice reform. So uh, topic dissents this year will probably all be uh, relevant to criminal justice reform plans generally. So there's two major ones that uh, apply this year. One is the federalism disadvantage, which uh, if you all remember from like social studies classes, the Eighth Amendment says pretty much that uh, the federal government's role is only to do things that have specifically been outlined as its responsibility in the Constitution. So the division between states and the federal government, if there is some issue that the Constitution doesn't say this is a federal issue, the federal government is supposed to leave it to the states to deal with. So the big argument with this is that uh, criminal justice reform is a state and local level issue that, you know, most of the prisons are state prisons anyway, that that's the level at which criminal justice reform is happening now and should continue to happen. And by having a uh, federal action to try to deal with that, it undermines kind of that balance of powers that we've usually expected. And we can expect uh, if we kind of set the precedent of, <clears throat> excuse me, and if we set the precedent of having the federal government kind of set the agenda for states, then that means that states can't get other important things done, which uh, in the context of arguments you'll see this year, we'll probably be saying, hey, you know, the federal government pulled out of the Paris Accords and clearly isn't committed to fixing climate change at all. So the only hope we have of the U.S. making any impact on climate change is through individual states uh, fighting climate change. But in a world where the federal government is kind of setting state agendas, uh, which would be uh, kind of established as a result of doing the plan, then we can expect that we're definitely not going to solve climate change and it's just going to be a big disaster. So uh, the other 
uh, disadvantage. And this one is actually one that you all can expect to use if you go to GFCA tournaments is the movements disadvantage. So this is based on a pretty common sociological argument that pretty much says, you know, there's uh, a lot of momentum and movements right now. Uh, we're kind of like specific to movements happening right now. It very much uh, looks like we have a lot of potential for change, but if we kind of make, if we make a symbolic gesture through the federal government that makes it look like we've achieved a big goal for those social movements, then it loses momentum. A bunch of people who were like really down and committed are like, okay, we did it. I don't have to be worried about this anymore. You know, the media is like, okay, they got what they wanted. Uh, it kind of just loses steam and falls apart. And that's how historically a lot of movements have died. So the argument is that we won't really get any substantial change because if we do the AF, we'll just have one big symbolic action that kills the rest of the movement. All right, and then politics DAs are the next type of disadvantage. You will see these probably every single season uh, in the GFCA. So there's two kinds, one that is specific to uh, this year and that you see usually every four years is the election disadvantage. So uh, both the November Senate elections will be a focus and then the uh, 2020 presidential election will be a focus. And the election just adds pretty much argue that if we pass uh, that if we do whatever the plan is, it's going to look really unpopular and cause a certain party, usually uh, the Democratic Party, this year you can expect to be the Democratic Party, uh, to not get elected and that's going to be disastrous. So the election to said is basically saying, okay, if we pass the plan, people are going to hate it and then Trump's going to get reelected and ruin everything. And then there's the more generic uh, politics to said that you see in non-election years, which is uh, just agenda DAs. This is usually what people are referring to when they say politics DAs. Uh, this is just based on the concept that, you know, the um, it's not easy to get bills passed through Congress. We live in a very partisan world. Things aren't always popular. Usually it takes a lot of uh, compromising or having certain amounts of uh, sway with Congress members to actually get things passed. And politics DAs pretty much say the plan is unpopular. Uh, if we pass it, it's going to use up way too much like political favor, uh, clout, things that we collectively would refer to as political capital for um, some other really important thing to get passed. So uh, this year it would look something like, okay, we passed the AF, but now we can't get this climate change bill through, or now we can't uh, get some other really big important bill through. And then not passing that bill leads to some horrible impact. And then the final type of disadvantage I want to touch on is um, actor ones. So this one, court packing is another disadvantage that you'll see this year. Uh, if you've been keeping up with the news uh, and seeing how there's a lot of tension right now over if the Republicans are going to confirm um, a Trump nominee before the election, or just generally like before whoever wins 2020 is actually inaugurated and takes over in January, uh, then it's going to cause really bad things. So the it's okay now, but not great is saying Republicans don't really care about packing the court right now because we already have a fairly conservative court. But if we pass the plan, which is super liberal, then they're gonna be like, okay, now we definitely need to like load the Supreme Court in our favor by having another Supreme Court justice. So uh, you might notice a lot of these are very much about kind of political sway and how doing things that are unpopular is going to backfire in the long run. Uh, so yeah, now I'm gonna hand it over to Jordan. Okay, awesome. So one thing I think it's important to clarify is that throughout this entire debate year, first semester, second semester, we'll have the same resolution, which is resolve the United States federal government to enact substantial criminal justice reform in the United States in one or more of the following forensic science, policing, and sentencing. So in the AUDL, whether you're in novice or in open, you have what's called a closed packet, which means that you can't go find new articles you want to read in the round unless it's... Uh, like allowed by the AUDL or they put new uh, evidence out and you can't create new affirmatives. The affirmatives the AUDL gives you are the affirmatives you're going to use in the round. In the GFCA, which we've been referring to, is the Georgia Forensics Coaches Association. This is also known as the National Circuit, where you have debaters from other states, 
and other parts of the United States uh, coming together for one tournament, usually in person, but this year over Zoom, uh, to debate the criminal justice topic. What typically happens if you're in the novice division of the GFCA or the national circuit is during the first semester, you also have a closed packet. The affirmatives uh, are usually different than the ones that AUDL puts out, but they're around the same like skill level, like around the same amount of evidence in that regard. But sometimes in the second semester, they open up the novice division. That means new affirmatives can be introduced, uh, which comes with new plans and new advantages, new disadvantages could be produced. And the way we kind of keep the reins on the new affirmatives that can be produced and to make sure that everyone's prepared to have these debates and for them to go in depth is that we really have to keep the resolution in focus, which basically just means that every plan, whether it's new or old or released by the GFCA, AODL, or a different school, needs to fall under the resolution and that it has to meet every word that's a part of the resolution. So that general concept uh, if you could go to the next slide. <laughs> that general concept is called topicality, which is basically, does the plan fit under the resolution? In the 1NC, which is an argument, because topicality is generally an argument that the negative will make against the affirmative to say, hey, this plan isn't topical, it does not fit under the resolution. So in the 1NC, you would start with an interpretation. You would define a specific word in the resolution or a phrase. For example, in the United States, you'd probably say in the United States means the 50 states. Then you would say how they violated this interpretation. If the plan is not domestic reform, but rather international reform, like some sort of treaty or an international effort, then it would violate the part of the resolution that specifies that the plan must take place in the United States. Then you could give your standards, which is the reasons why topicality matters. Impacts could be things such as fairness or education. You could argue that we can't have substantive in-depth debates if both sides aren't adequate, adequately prepared to debate the affirmative that's been proposed. And we'll go more into detail with topicality and the standards and the arguments and the responses you would make to this uh, in a later lecture. Some words that will be pretty important this year to define and to have definitions of are criminal justice reform, which generally does not include civil penalties like getting fines or civil courts, which is more of like an interpersonal rather than a, a crime you've committed. And some authors say that criminal justice reform must mean that it's progressive or it results in a smaller amount of incarceration, but other authors agree with this. There's kind of some controversy on that topic. Another big word is enact, which by definition is to establish by legal authoritative act to make into law. And a lot of courts, uh, judges and authors will say that only Congress can enact things because only Congress can make things into law. This specifically you might see uh, interacting with affirmatives that have the Supreme Court or the executive branch uh, take certain actions for criminal justice reform because your opponent might say, well, those branches can't enact things. For the beginning of the year, you don't really have to worry about topicality too much because you will have a set affirmative that I'll go over in a couple of minutes. So if you, uh, for the next slide. So there are three branches or three topics or umbrellas that the resolution specifies, which are policing, forensic science, and sentencing. So policing, what does that mean? What are authors saying? It would, it's usually defined as the activities carried out by police officers in order to preserve law and order. But who is the police? What is policing in general is more of a broad question. For example, prison officials police the behaviors of those who are in a prison. So they might be considered police officers or part of policing. Uh, officials who are officials or officers who are in detention centers like involved with ICE may also be grouped under policing because of that definition. You might also say policing doesn't have to be conducted by police officers. The NSA or government organizations that do surveillance on citizens or possible terrorist organizations or investigations of that sort may also be considered engaging in policing as an activity. Examples of affirmatives that could stem from under the policing category could be body cameras, uh, increased community policing, 
having a community review board to investigate police misconduct rather than the police handling, handling it themselves. We could end qualified immunity. A lot of these things are already in the national spotlight because of the recent BLM movement. So there's a lot of really good evidence about it. Uh, on the next slide. I'll oh, give it a second. <laughs> On the next slide, which considers forensic science, generally forensic science is the application of scientific principles and techniques to the matter of criminal justice, especially as relation to collection, examination, and analysis of physical evidence. What does this really mean? So when you're introducing evidence into the court to defend or to prosecute, it has to be up to a certain standard. Usually these standards are determined by the science community or by certain policymakers in the Congress. So most affirmatives will probably argue that the current scientific standard is not the best one out there. And instead we should be using this other scientific standard for evidence, um, for the collection of evidence and for introducing that evidence into court. So possible affirmatives that could send from this could be accreditation standards for crime labs, the ones who do the forensics on the evidence. We could change how evidence is handled. Maybe there's a certain procedure for introducing it into the court specifically. Uh, you could increase testing to establish validity in crime lab results. You could also say that some forms of forensic science, like matching hair or matching DNA, are very inaccurate and they produce bad results, and thus we should stop using it in criminal court. Uh, the next slide is about sentencing specifically, which is about the post-conviction stage of the criminal justice process in which the defendant receives a punishment. So you've already said, yeah, they're guilty. The jury has confirmed it. So now the judge will give a sentence to the person who's been convicted. This is usually will concern how long someone should be in jail for a certain crime. You could see an end or change to mandatory minimums, which is when people, if you commit this crime, you have to go for at least this amount of time, which some people will say is not proportional to the offense we could change the way drug crimes are sentenced. Like right now, crack and cocaine have disparate or different sentences, which a lot of people contribute to racial biases within the system. So that could be changed or amended. And we could also abolish or change the requirements for the death penalty, which is actually the affirmative that the GFCA currently has put out uh, and that you'll see in those debates if you decide to compete on the national circuit or be a part of the competitive aspect of the debate bridge program, which is the next slide. <laughs> The plan text reads, the, United States, the Supreme Court of the United States should rule that the death penalty is unconstitutional. So one thing you should like notice here is that instead of the Congress, which is the usual actor of a plan you'd read in a debate, instead it's the Supreme Court. So later in the year, you might see some topicality arguments interacting with this, saying that, well, the Supreme Court can enact things, that's just not topical. But right now, the two disadvantages that were gone over earlier are the movements DA and the court packing DA. The court packing DA also interacts with, the, with this affirmative because it's an actor-based DA based off the actor being the Supreme Court. So that's, so that's what the link story would mostly be based off of. There are two pretty big advantages for the death penalty affirmative. First is the racism advantage that talks about how so uh, executions have resumed like post uh, the COVID shutdown and how the death penalty is a remnant from slavery and from the lynching period of African Americans in the United States, which is actually the reason that the death penalty was once deemed unconstitutional in 1972 by the Supreme Court. It has uh, since then has been reinstated though. There's also a huge amount of racial bias in sentencing based off of the race of the victim or the race of the defendant and that's statistically confirmed and statistically proven. This affirmative would argue that there's no reform that can be made to the death penalty that would make it more fair because juries, judges uh, could be racist, the entire system is predisposed against uh, African Americans or people of color in the United States, and that the only option is to abolish the death penalty. The impact of this affirmative is a bit different from an affirmative you uh, might be used to, but I believe this year the mass incarceration affirmative in the AUDL has the same impact, which is that rejecting racism is a prerequisite to having a good ethical uh, predisposition. 
So if we want to act in an ethical way, the first thing we have to do is reject racism because you can't be ethical if you accept racism and accept uh, unwarranted bias and bigotry into uh, like the political sphere or into society in general. The second advantage is called the dignity advantage. It has a similar impact centered around ethics and how you have to prioritize ethics. Mostly the reason in the 1AC that you're saying you're prioritizing ethics is because your opponent is probably going to bring up a disadvantage that has an extinction impact. So you're going to have to learn how to weigh ethics against an extinction level impact or a more a widespread material form of violence. The dignity advantage mostly talks about how capital punishment or the death penalty is morally indefensible. It's torture on the victims of the punishment. It also inflicts a large amount of trauma on the judges, the, juror, the jurors, the lawyers, and the families of both sides because they feel that they have personal responsibility for the punishment and that they are essentially killing somebody. And this advantage makes it a more broad argument that it's not just about the death or the killing, but it's also about the confinement before the punishment of someone having to live in a jail cell, usually by themselves, and know that soon they are going to die and having to deal with like the mental pain that inflicts on someone. There's also the huge possibility that that person wasn't actually guilty. Every couple months, you have someone who is on death row, like they're going to get the death penalty. And then it's found out that they actually weren't guilty of the crime due to, due to new DNA standards or an eyewitness comes forward and says they were lying. Like there's a lot of faulty parts of our criminal justice system and the conviction process in general. That means that there's a lot of times there's wrongful conviction. But once somebody's dead and once you've inflicted the death, the death penalty, you can't reverse that. They're gone forever while the other option would be to incarcerate them and they could simply just be let free after a wrongful conviction is overturned. The solvency contention or the part of that affirmative mostly centers around how reform is not enough, the death penalty has to be abolished. And the second part of that is that if the Supreme Court rules on this, uh, there would be spillover. The Supreme Court has a thing called dicta, which is basically the justification of their ruling. They're saying this thing is unconstitutional and here's the reason why. In future cases, whether, whether it's in the Supreme Court or in state courts or in uh, any form of court in the United States, that dicta or reasoning can be applied to other court cases. So if the United States rules of the penalty, rules of the death penalty is unconstitutional because of like harsh standards or a certain reason, that precedent could spill over into other forms of punishment, like possibly solitary confinement or qualified immunity, or that justification could be used to rule that other things are unconstitutional or illegal, which could at large create a lot more criminal justice reform and could create a lot, a lot more sound or better system of criminal justice in the United States. So that's around the end of the slides we have prepared, but we're completely open to questions. And of course, like we can be contacted if you're watching this through YouTube, through uh, email or reaching out to Candace or anyone that's a part of the AUDL. Yep, I wanna add a quick note that I realized I forgot to put in my notes. Uh, the one other big structural difference is that instead of four rounds, you have six. So instead of just going on a Saturday, tournaments usually start on a Friday when you have your four rounds. And then on Saturday, they have the last two. And then some people, based on how well they did, will go on to single elimination rounds and everyone else is just done if they didn't make it to those limited elimination rounds. Right. And we'll definitely go into more detail with how a tournament looks, how it functions over Zoom versus in person uh, next week when we talk about the differences in like etiquette and procedure between the GFCA slash National Circuit and the AUDL. Anyone got any questions? Might you explain the concept of fiat for uh, the debaters? I know that that's a concept that gets more discussed widely on the national circuit, but we don't really hear that in the AUDL. Uh, sure. So fiat is basically the concept that if the affirmative is proposing a plan, we should assume that the plan passes through Congress 
doesn't get overturned by the Supreme Court and there's no veto by the executive branch because it doesn't really serve debate to debate again, debate about, oh, Republicans wouldn't let this bill pass because it's too progressive. Because then we can't focus on the implications or the results of the plan, like the advantages or disadvantages. Fiat isn't really something that you have to win in the debate. It's more of an assumed part of policy debate. So walking into the round, you can go ahead and assume like this plan's gonna pass through Congress. We shouldn't have to debate about who's gonna vote for it or who wouldn't vote for it. There's also some, like if you get into like really high level national debate, there's some criticisms of this concept, but that's kind of like a topic for a later date that's kind of confusing and that we can get into if, there, if that like comes up. Okay. Well, it is um, 647, and so I don't, um, we've had uh, two wonderful uh, speakers this evening, um, Jordan and Alicia, so I want to give them both a round of applause. Um, I think we'll stick around until about 650 in case you want to reach out individually to us to ask us any questions, but around 650, if no one's asking any questions, we'll wrap up the video. Um, as a reminder, as uh, Jordan just shared, next week we're going to have, our next lecture is going to be on uh, culture shock and etiquette, and so what it really will look like. Uh, and the differences you'd see at a, a national circuit or GFCA tournament as opposed to an AUDL tournament, what the climate differences might be, what um, the difference in experience just might be for you um, entering this different community. Um, and then, uh, and so that's going to happen next week and that link will go out soon. Um, so thank you so much for joining us this evening. Again, we're going to stick around uh, for a couple more minutes if you have any questions, but otherwise we'll see you next week. So the question that we got in the chat from um, Coach Dawson is, is, is the, are these lectures just for high school debaters? Um, no. So only high school debaters can join the competitive component of the program. And so that means you'll get support to participate in uh, tournaments on the GFCA and national circuit because those tournaments are geared towards high schoolers. Um, and so what that means is if you join Debate Bridge with your debate partner, um, on the competitive aspect at the high school division, we'll set up tutoring sessions for you with someone like Jordan or like Alicia, um, or you'll be given additional support and mentoring as you're preparing to attend a tournament. Um, and so that's just the competitive component. There's also just the educational component, which anyone is welcome to attend. So it doesn't matter who you are, um, if, you, if you're affiliated with the AUDL and you're interested in learning more about competitive debate and what it looks like outside of the AUDL, you're welcome to attend these sessions.